apologize. I had um, my uh, limit of disturbance off. Um, is it okay if I share a screen just so I can we can absolutely yes. Go right ahead. Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is um, just to give everyone an understanding of where we are. Um, so this is the new Amazon facility. Um, there's the existing parking lot here, and it's this grassy area here that we're taking a look at. Okay. And we're going to be building a parking, or we, we would like to build a parking lot with um, your approval on this here. Um, so this is this is a this is an older photo, but um, we'll go to the street view in a moment. That there's the tree line that comes along through here. Yeah. Um, and so this is obviously had been cleared out. Um, this has more vegetation coming in through here. And so what these trees are, the evergreen trees around here, um, I, I apologize. I looked at our set of plans uh, after. And so our, there's the, the trees that are long back here, but because we have to build the um, the um, pavement up because of the activity use limitations, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Okay. Uh, we we are going to have to take out those trees in order for, to uh, make the grade eight, to connect um, tie into the existing grades through here. Okay, so is there going to be anything replanted there? If those trees uh, yes. Out? So we we do have um, a planting. We do have a, a, a plan coming in and putting the trees back around. Okay. Um, and then along Everett Street, it's not as clustered as what it is now. Um, okay. So one of the items that we had talked about um, possibly on, on Saturday was taking a look along Everett Street to make sure we have planting there. And so then coming along here, um, making sure that these are a mix of evergreens to replace that, what we're looking okay. at here. So it looks like you guys are taking all those trees out, but you're going to be adding more along the Everett Street side. So we're going. So we're going to. So along the Everett Street side here, we'll be adding trees along the frontage, and then we will be adding these trees. Right now, this is what we're showing along the edge here. Um, and I apologize. I'm not a. <laughs> I'm not the a landscape person, but it, it's a mix of maples, dogwood, um, honey locusts, and cherries. So in, um, so with some spruce. Um, but if you guys have different pr pr uh, preferred trees, we can obviously um, have that conversation okay. of what is going along back here. Okay. Any of my commissioners have any questions for Sus? Yeah, I do. Okay, Joe. That, that photo that we looked at initially looked like an old photo, you said? Oh, yeah. So this is just this one here. Oh, this yeah, that one, yeah. Yeah, so this is um, just from Google Earth, just from Google Maps. And so it looks as though I can't yeah, usually Google find Maps, it. Yeah, it seemed like, Google it Earth like there was a lot more trees when we looked. Yeah, so this, is, this was just meant to show us where we are. Um, this in the That's area. 2009, I think. Yeah, is it? Okay. this is a yeah. better representation of what's there today. Okay. There, there is a um, so this is this is we're in the I, I changed location. Sorry, we're in the parking lot looking back toward the trees. So there is the there's the tree line along the MBTA corridor here and coming up through here. Yeah, and uh, another thing that's that's puzzling me is we just had the site inspection on Saturday, and at Saturday's meeting you said none of the trees were gone. So something happened between Saturday. And today to make a change in that? No, I apologize. I miss, I looked at the um, plans incorrectly right before I saw you. I was looking at um, the site plan, which I which show it, it looked as though we still had room. I forgot. I apologize with having it being raised. I forgot that we had to like that we need this area for the grading tie-in. Now, could you leave that on for a minute? I have a question that in relating relating to this plan. 
uh, in the upper right hand corner, there's a particular grid area. Keep going right, right up there. What is, what is that? This here? This is, is that the, the underwater? Uh, go ahead. The underground detention chambers, yes. And that's, that's all not in existence now? Correct. And, and you're going to add all of that? Yes, so that is gonna be the stormwater detention in order to control the flow off of the site. That looks pretty extensive. Is it for more than just that new parking area? Uh, nope, it's just for this area. It's just because we're going um, from, because it's all impervious and then, so because it's all a grassy area now and in order to make up for this whole adding this, adding this impervious area, it's, it's sized um, you know, we try to keep them as small as possible because they, you know, they cost money. So this is, this is size to accommodate, um, and, um, mitigate the, so to make sure that we maintain the pre-construction flow rate coming off the site into this swale here. All right. Thank you. Any other commissioners have any questions? So how much, um, are you adding to the elevation that that you need to, so you're basically saying that you've got to add to the elevation, but you're also uh, going to slope up on that uh, far side where the trees are. Uh, so we, so it's the, it's a, um, you can kind of see it in, in this photo that it's a little bit of a, it's an uneven slope that generally comes down this way. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing is around back here, at the high point here, we're at about the the pavement will be at about existing grade. But then, as we come down further this way, we're putting the pavement on in the in the section on top of the um, the existing the or close to, or on top of the existing ground because what's happening is in order to the the activity the area um, the activity use limitation uh, there's this is a Cap. I looked at the um, AUL, and it looks like it was um, trash that was there, and then covered with four feet of fill. And so, if you're within that four feet of fill, um, you you still have to handle it properly and make sure you're not mixing the soils. But you're you're okay to work within that four feet. Once you go below that four feet, you have to um, the contractor has to have a um, a soil handling um, plan. Um, and it, it may, it complicates things further and um, you want to, you know, you're, they were trying to stay away from the buried, basically trash that's underneath. So we're trying to stay within that four foot area. So the, up here, the, this is the existing uh, 14 contour. So we're about right on top of it here. But when you get down to this side, um, here's the, like the contour is elevation eight and we're up at about 11. So where we have about a three foot where we come in and we come off, uh, we're coming down straight from the top of the hill. We end at about three feet above existing grade there so that we can put in this system and have the, um, have the pipes come out within that top five, the top four feet. And so that we, we're trying to minimize any disturbance to the um, the trash that's underneath. Okay, two, two other questions. One is, um, did someone count the trees that are currently there? And is it the same, gonna be the same number of trees going in or more? Oh. Um, and secondly, those are mature trees. Um, I was worried about replacing mature trees with saplings, some percentage of which will probably not survive. So um, has thought been given to that? Um, I have not counted, but I'm open to a condition of, you know, having at minimum the same number of trees or, or more, you know, obviously I understand the point of, you know, mature trees are not the same as new coming in. Um, and, you know, having a condition with being the evergreen to maintain that buffer. Um, but I don't have the number right now. Something in the conditions that you would replace any that um, for at least some period of time did not thrive. Yeah, so that I mean that that 
I would expect to be, that's a typical condition um, okay. with landscaping that, you know, if we're, we're saying you know, there's trees going in, you, you want to make sure that they actually are there and not just for the first year. Okay, thank you. I think um, along those lines, I, I am surprised since Saturday that the trees are coming out. I understand what you're saying, um, but I'm on the same lines with Dave is that they are mature trees. And I'm actually wondering um, if the parking lot could be set back away from the tree so they could be, they would be able to stay. If that can't be done, is there a possibility, It'd probably be very costly, but to remove the existing trees professionally and put them back. Um, I mean, with these. I mean, there's a lot of coverage there. Um, right, with these being the, um... Oh, my mind just went blank and I'm saying pine, but they're not pine trees. Evergreens, yeah. Yeah, I mean, with this type of trees, um, you know, typically they don't, I mean, and I apologize, I'm not a landscape architect, but my understanding is this type isn't one that you typically can save. Um, but, I, you know, we can certainly look into it. Um, as far as the, uh, the, the um, parking has been brought down as south as much as we can. Um, we're trying. We, we're trying to catch in, um, tie into grades on this side. Um, but you, you kind of have to. Unfortunately, we have to. You have to take them out in order to make the grade, the whole property, come down into that. Uh, infiltration system that you're putting in. Right, and, 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 I, and I apologize. I, I I just didn't look at the plans close enough with the grading plan. I am not. I apologize for missing that. I understand that this is this is a big. This I I recognize that this is frustrating on your end. Of this isn't a oh we were going to put in you know a sidewalk here and it's over here and yeah. I, I get that this is yeah. different and I well, apologize for that. And to change the whole tenor of uh, our site visit. Um, we were very, we were very accommodating in the fact that, uh, and happy in the fact that you were not, we were not going to lose the trees. And now you come in here, and that's what I said. I mean, it was only Saturday, and uh, I find it rather odd that, you know, now all of a sudden the, the one thing that was saving this and, and making it uh, more respectful is the fact that you're going to keep the trees, and now you're not going to keep the trees. So uh, I'm, I, 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 from judging from the tone of the other two members of the. Conservation Commission, I don't think anybody's happy with this. Mm. How many parking spaces would you lose if you set, um, gave a 10 foot buffer there? To maintain the trees. probably make this work. So about 30. Yeah. The problem is going to be though, if you pitch that parking lot, if you leave those trees and pitch the parking lot, the water from the tree level to the other property is still going to go backwards and not into the into the, the infiltration system that you're putting in. I think that's something that could be worked on with the engineers, Nick. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with you at all. I'm just saying we, we need to make sure that if we do put some sort of a buffer that we uh, we maintain what's there and the water keeps on going to the infiltration system and not into someone else's property. That's what I, I just want to be aware be make sure we don't large, do something like that. I'm sorry. Isn't that a rather large um, retention area that should hold the water? I mean, mm. isn't that where it's going to the retention area? Yeah. Isn't that where it's sloped to? Well, yeah, that's uh, that's what we want to make sure that it's sloped to. But right now, if they leave the trees and put their parking lot in it, the tree area is not going to slope to the parking lot because of the uh, the pavement. I want to save the trees. Don't get me wrong. I want to save them. So I want to come up with a happy medium here. To well, really maybe maybe a good alternative. I can't see any reason why this has to be rushed right now. Is that Sue's comes back with a, a plan that can accommodate the saving of the trees and maybe doing a little, little bit of readjustment on this parking lot. Yeah, 
It's definitely, I, I have no issues. I'd like that. to I, I tell you the truth. If, so you're gonna come I, up I, with I apologize that, I mean, I, I recognize I created this conversation that we could have been done with not having this in your head at all. And I apologize for that. But in order, because of the limitation of the depths we're able to go to, we've, we've had, we've pushed this out as far as we can. And so it, the, the, you know, in order to, we're, we're, to, to treat the runoff and to detain the runoff from here in order to um, discharge, we've pushed it as hard as much as we can this way without getting into the, without getting to the bottom of that four foot layer. Yeah. And so, I mean, these are, um, you know, mature evergreen trees, but these are also trees that grow, um, you know, I, I recognize that it's not gonna be, you know, within the next five years. However, it is, you know, 10 years we have, uh, we can have, you know, we can replace it to these similar trees of this height that would grow to this rather than um, in, I can take a look at, we have that we can have more of replicating this. But I mean, you know, you know, actually this is kind of actually helping me that if this is 2009, it, I mean, I understand that 10 years is a yeah. long time, but this, this is 2009 and this is, you know, not much going on here. Yeah. We could do the same thing well, I don't know how my commissioners feel, but I you know, obviously we want to. Well, I know how they feel. We want to save the trees, but if for some reason they have to be taken out, can we come up with that option of either saving the trees that are there and replanting them, or putting some something that's going to be a similar size and height? That's what I think we're looking for. Uh, could, may I ask a question? Sure, absolutely, Commissioner. So, let's leave that image on for a second. If you go in the lower right hand corner, the it looks like an area that's barren right in there. That's not your property. That's not Amazon's. Is that Amazon's? Correct. No, that that's offsite. That's offsite. And yeah, so that this uh, is the detention for this parking lot here. So this all drains to here and goes through. Okay. And and put the arrow where your retention is going to be. Yeah, that's what I the, I, I suspected. And now you're telling me that you, you know, I, I don't know. It seems like you could reconfigure this and save those trees. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure I understand why the trees have to go. I understand about the pitch and everything, but you could actually start the pitch lower and leave the trees slow, the water sloping down to the trees. Yep. Since you're not gonna have any cars there anyhow where the trees are, Correct? Or are you? Yeah, you do. You do have cars right there. So the trees around it, so there'd be some so in here. Are there. So you're basically just taking out trees and going all the way with parking. Right? No, they're gonna be they're gonna be replacing the trees with other trees. So yeah, but, but there is there's a portion of it's here. a paltry amount of trees that you're replacing. I'm looking at yeah, them. Yeah, they look yeah. Like, they look like what, maybe about eight? Yeah, I'm not talking about. The, yeah, yeah. So I have, we can what, increase the number through this here. This is what Mr. Etoff was talking about. You, you're talking about trees that uh, look like they're uh, close to 20 years, some of them, and you're going to replace them with, uh, like Dave said, saplings and and uh, the lifespan of those, particularly near the tracks and everything, are probably uh, one out of three are going to survive if we're lucky. So we can revise this to be more like, we can revise the planting plan for this type of evergreen. Are the trees going back and you're taking them out. So when you replace them, are they going back? How, where are they, where is the um, location that you're replacing them? Like if they're, on the edge, are you coming in? Are you going back further with the trees? So, if we go over here, are you replacing them in the same spot or the same location? So, this grouping that comes out this way, we would be um, sorry, too far up. Hold on, it looks like you're pushing them back a little bit. I think here is probably a better angle. 
So these few at the end and this one in this grouping here that are above the outs, like, so there's the, the border around coming, sorry, the border around, and then there's a little grouping here that jump, the juts out, and then this grouping on the end. So we would be replacing in the same area of these ones and these ones, and then we would continue it around up here. Well, why would you have to replace them then? Um, because if these, if they're these, going in the same location, what is the purpose of taking out a mature tree and replacing it with a younger tree? Because this, from this grass, we only have four feet to work with as far as excavation goes. And so we have to build up in order to make this work. And so we need to grade into this area. And how, what is the, um, how far are you grading up? Um, I think you mentioned there would be a cap put on this because of the land. No, so there's the existing, we're working with the existing cap. And so unfortunately what's happening is we're grading into this area. So, I mean, we can, um, you know, the, this 14, so we're, we're putting about a foot of fill here, trying to, trying to match grades. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, we can, you know, go in and, um, you know, this, this end grouping of trees and then the, the portion that bumps out will need to go. But as far as the ones along, you know, outside of the parking area, um, we have to do some grading in between. And usually trees are not fans of having grading at their, you know, at their roots. So that's why they would have to go. Um, we can we can try to keep them, but it, typically- I like to just, I don't see why we can't. I know it's a more of an expense, but we are talking about Amazon. Take those trees out and then put them right back in place where they need to be after the grading is done. Use the same trees. I don't, I don't understand why we can't do that. You know, then obviously you guys are going to be adding more on, so there will be more trees. But I think we can keep the same trees. I don't know what it, what the expense of it is, but I'd like to see something like that. I don't would know. It, if that's would, it, would it be such a bad idea to just perhaps leave a little bit of the green space there and not come right up to that area? Um, I mean, I'm trying to hit a certain number of parking stalls, but. Well, maybe we could put the shorter cars there. <laughs> the small delivery vehicles, yeah. Now, see, I, I, I feel as though all of us are having a hard time getting a perspective now. I, I almost want to suggest that we have another site inspection with Sue's and look at what's going and what could be uh, accommodated and what could stay because this is a different tenor than what we had when we went at the site for the people who were there. Joe, let me throw out this idea. It would look like, I mean. I mean, there's a lot of green space there. Yeah. Let me throw out this idea and I don't know how people feel. Obviously Amazon wants to get started on this and uh, they, gotta, they, they can get started in one area of it and maybe we can approve it with a condition that we have a site visit with a better landscaping plan for these trees. But they, you know, we, we gotta make sure it gets, it gets done the way we want it. You can have, have it approved with a stipulation of either replant those trees, but, and we know chances are if we dig them up, they're gonna die anyways, unfortunately, because of the type of tree they are. Uh, to just and just have it replaced with a similar tree. Well, but the nice, but wasn't the, the suggestion I had before that they just we keep this open and let them come back with a better plan? Yeah, we can do that. We can do that. Yeah. I mean, this is a major change to do on the night of the. Uh, yeah, I day. agree with you. I agree. Well, if that's so, the will of the commission, then we can post the. I'm sorry, Dave. You got something you want to say? I'm sorry. Yeah. So. This plan that you're showing right now, um, if you zoom in um, a little bit, especially near where the trees are, is there like, is that light drawing in the background 
what is originally there? Is that representing what's originally there? This is the tree line, yes. Okay, all right. Um, so and I'm kind of looking at a couple of these spots and I, and I get the whole grade thing, but you know, especially where that, that one tree is, your, cross, your cursor just sort of went by it in the sort of left-hand side, about a third of the way up right there, yeah. In that general area, it looks like that's that bump that, that seems to have the most dense vegetation. I could yeah. be wrong, but I, I feel like that's the one that sort of bumps out and it has what appears to be the most mature trees. And, and I feel like, you know, that might be the place to try and save some of those. If there was a way to like, maybe just focus in on that. And then in the other spots, I um, might be more amenable to your planting uh, plan. Yeah, so, so you can see where I'm talking, that even though that, that pic, well, that picture shows it really nicely, that bump that comes out. So. And I think the reason why those are most mature is probably because they're getting the best sunlight and they're also the driest. They don't, they're not, they have their roots in the water. Is that our buddy? <laughs> Is he taking his socks and suit shoes off? <laughs> oh, they're, they're off. So what's happening? This is this is a, you know kind of hard to see, but so this outcropping, this trees here is this bump out here, okay. and then this grouping of trees here is what comes out here, and so we'd want to take out you know four or five trees. You know, I can see if I can count here and then we'd want to take out you know four or five trees here in order to make this work. So, Suze, I, I, I realize that might have, have to be taken out to push it back but all these other ones that are on the left why can't we keep all those and go around the corner and just cut a few spaces back? Mm. Yeah those ones in the back don't seem to be in any area that you have to touch. Yeah. So it, they're just they're in here and and, and I, I I apologize for that's all right for Saturday. Um, but yeah, so this is this is all in here. Um, but so it sounds as though we're kind of a, stuck at a point where um, yeah, I think we might need another site visit and uh, come up with a better game plan. Um, I like to try. I realize some of them may have to be moved, especially those ones closer to Everett Street, but. And if they do, maybe we can come up with a compromise, leave most of the other ones on the other side and just move the ones closest to Everett Street back. Um, all right, we'll see what we can do. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll postpone this until the October meeting. Is that the uh, the will of the commission? Yeah, it sounds like a good idea. It sounds good. Everyone's okay with that? Everyone's okay with postponing until October? I am. Right, Suze, I appreciate you coming on tonight, Suze, and we will, uh, I'll be in touch to plan a site visit for uh, the end of this month. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, so the next item on the agenda was um, for the City Revere, Alden Ave, and Rice Ave, the installation of the 12 inch drain. It's going to be pulled until the meeting. Um, I just I need to make a motion just to open up the hearing and then um, we'll phone it. So, do I have a motion to open the hearing for Rice Ave? Motion to open the hearing. Second. Sorry, do I have a motion to open up the public hearing for Rice Avenue? Uh, motion to open the public hearing. Can you hear us? I think you're muted, Dave. I can't hear you. No, I'm not muted. I can hear Dave. Can you hear us, Nick? Can I do something? You're okay now. I can hear you now. Nick? What? <laughs> can you guys hear me now? I we can't can hear, hear you. you. We can't see you. There you go. All right, that's a little better. All right, so I have a motion to open up the public hearing. I'm sorry. A motion to open the public hearing. David's making the motion. Who seconded it? Raise your hand. <laughs> All right. All right, so we're going to postpone that meeting till next month. It's because someone's calling me on. I guess what's doing this. You should put your phone on airplane mode. I'm gonna put my phone on the highway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, 
The next item on the agenda is a public meeting for Mass DEP file 0610165, Sagamore Street, request for certificate of compliance. So back in 1987, this address was given a order of conditions and was never closed up properly. So they just, the property has recently been sold. So they're just looking for certificate of compliance so they can sell the property. They have a Let me just grab the folder here one second. I think the gentleman is on. Can you guys still hear me? Mm -hmm. I don't know what I did with my phone. All right, that's better. You guys hear me now? Yes. yes. All right. So... Again, this was a, an order of conditions from 1987 that I want to issue to these people so they can sell their property. Do I have a motion to approve the certificate of compliance? I'll make that motion. Motion by Joe, Commissioner Laval. Do I have a second? A second. Seconded by Dave Etoff. And I'm not sure if the realtor is on for this, but if you are, uh, get in touch with me tomorrow and I will get you a uh, copy of the uh, certificate of compliance. Next is a public hearing request for an extension of an ORAD, Mass DEP file 0610704, H&B Construction. Uh, this is for, um, let me just grab the folder. It is for 459 or 463 Revere Beach Boulevard. So back in 2017, they got a um, resource delineation done and they just want to extend it for three more years. Um, do I have a... Um, a motion to approve the uh, extension. Motion to approve. Second. Motion, motion to approve by David and seconded by Joe. All right. So next we have the infamous superintendent of the water department, Don Chamella, on here that wants to speak about uh, the Bay Road area and the Fragmites. Well, I like infamous. <laughs> <laughs> You want to hear um, about the goats? Uh, well, okay. So I tried, and unfortunately, um, well, the goats worked, but the Phragmites just bounced right back. I mean, they just, they. Just, I think, I think, I think us pruning them helped them, if anything. Um, so, you know, looking at that area, the partic that particular area at the, at the end of Bay Road, I've been, I, I've asked the. Um, um, community development to reach out to the owners of those properties. Um, two of those lots out in that area are actually owned by the city of Rivera and um, the majority of them are privately owned, but totally unbuildable. So um, Nick has been involved with uh, communications with community development. We're reaching out to those owners. The long-term plan for that area is to restore it back to a salt marsh. That area historically was a salt marsh. It's just that area right now is all urban fill. When I was out there, there's nothing but, you know, tires and, you know, urban fill that was deposited there while they were building those houses at the end of Bay Road and, and, and um, uh, I was at Lomas Street. All, of the, all those houses when they were building, the builders must have thought that, well, someday they'll be able to migrate out further. And they were just depositing, you know, spoils out in, out in that area so that 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 material doesn't belong there if you look at maps back from the 1700s that we have where it shows the diamond creek meandering through that area that area was always a salt marsh so the long-term plan is to acquire those lots of land and get you know receive grants from the government like we did on the southbound side uh, about five years ago mm -hmm. and restore the level re, re, um, dig down and restore the level so nothing that grows there will be the salt marsh, which grows like 20 inches, 30 inches tall, and it's, it's beautiful, you know, it just waves in the wind. But uh, the Phragmites does nothing but choke everything out. Uh, it can grow to 13, 14 feet tall. Uh, it's an invasive species that doesn't even belong here. Um, and what it really is doing is it's, it's, it's clogging our ditch. So what it happens is, is it, you know, it thrives in, in fresh water, um, if it was some, if it was immersed in salt water, it wouldn't thrive. But the salt water doesn't have a chance to get to it. You know, we can't raise the gate enough that it can flood that area and not flood people out. 
So the, the answer is to reduce that salt marsh area. So, but the short term plan and, and just to try to keep it from being a fire hazard and not spending about $30,000 a year with the state to mow it is just to spray it with a herbicide. And when I first heard about this herbicide, I'm like, oh, no, I don't want it. You know, you, once it's in the ground, you, you can't take, you can't remove it. Well, when I found out, when I started making some phone calls about it with the state, find out that they call it a herbicide, but it's really not. It's, it's a salt acid. I, from what I understand, it's basically salty vinegar. <laughs> um, so, and it, what it does is it, 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 it attacks the roots with that saltiness that the Phragmite cannot thrive in. And <clears throat> so in about two, two, two to three treatments, two to three years, that Phragmite will not be there. Now, again, right now we spend about $30,000 a year to mow it, and it's still not a fire hazard. Um, this past year, we had a house that caught on fire. One ember flew over about 30, 300 yards from where the house caught on fire, and it lit the marsh on fire. It lit, and the frag was already laid down. It was already cut. So the frag just doesn't belong there. It just doesn't belong there. So I would like to, um, with, um, I would like to go and um, uh, through, it's through the state with uh, trying to get permitting for uh, this, um, for spraying of the Phragmite with this, uh, with this um, uh, salt acid. So. Um, I know the gentleman from the company in Connecticut, Donnie has called me this week and I, I unfortunately didn't call him back. Actually, I think he's here right now, Kurt. I believe he's yeah. here. Let me see if I can get him in here. Um, in the meantime, I just, for clarification, um, the plan is to spray um, sort of on the short term, but then to apply for grants that would allow you to change the elevation of the marsh? That, that's correct. Okay. Uh, Nick has been, been involved, been on the emails with Frank Strangey and Community Development. They're reaching out to those owners of the property. Um, like I said, two of the lots are actually owned by the city of Revere, so it's just our lots, but the lots are basically unbuildable. Um, and so we're looking to right now, Frank's looking to see who's might be in the rears with their taxes or, you know, how we can attain these pro properties. See if we they can acquire it. them or get them to work with us and get it all taken care of. Right. And we did it across the street on the southbound side, um, back at Doc Keegan's. Yeah. Yeah. And so we want to do the same thing on the northbound side. Um, and, uh, it gives us retention for floods and it just, you know, it, it, it restores it back to the way it was supposed to be. The yep. way it used to be. Donnie. Yes. Is that, that material that you want to use, is that what's been used by some cities for ice melt? I don't know. Cause I had heard something about using a, a purple state, liquid. Uh, the, uh, the state, the state has been using it quite often. So they have a lot of Phragmites that grow off, you know, off, off, off like the highways and stuff. So the, they, the state, the state uses it. It's a, it's, it's a, it's definitely a, a, a approved treatment and it's not, mm. it's not a chemical that that's going to get into the soil and, you know, well, it's going to be there for, forever. I, I know we have Kurt here. I don't know okay. if you can hear us. Kurt, yeah, can, you hear me? can you hear me okay? I can hear you now. Okay, yeah, this is Kurt with Innovative Mosquito. We've we've been doing Phragmites control uh, for the Commonwealth since 2003. Uh, primarily up at the uh, Merrimack River, uh, towns of Salisbury, Newbury, Newburyport, Ipswich, Raleigh. Uh, we've been using this, this product uh, for a number of years, actually, we used to mix it with a product you're all very familiar with recently called the glyphosate. Uh, glyphosate's in, in the news for more reasons um, than I don't need to get into right now unless you're into it. But, but uh, the product's name is called uh, Polaris AC Complete. That's an aquatic approved herbicide for the Commonwealth. And being a, being a salt acid based product, it actually interrupts an enzyme specific to plants that the plant needs to use to make amino acids. And amino acids are primarily the food for that plant. And when you, the amino acids are blocked, the signal to the plant is we have no more food and the plant begins to use up its uh, stored food in its root systems. And generally it's about two to three seasons for a high 90, 98% control 
due to the, the depth of the root system is it can be anywhere from six to eight feet. Um, if you're talking about removing soils in that area, which is you know, a really good idea if it's been filled and getting it back to uh, a salt marsh um, elevation, the introduction of, of seawater or good salt water will, will either stunt that plant or remove that plant or keep it at a much, much lower uh, height. And a removal of that plant will allow for more native plants to a wetlands to, uh, to, to take back that area. Um, generally what happens when, when there's a permit, if the permits have changed slightly, uh, the EPA and the Commonwealth uh, gets involved in some of the permitting processes but I do know that the cons come at one time for some work we've done up in uh, Ipswich. Uh, uh, they, they just, they had a determination of negative and then we just went forward without anything uh, deeper permitting that I think may or may not be required now, uh, but primarily the action of this product, uh, it's, it's ability to stay in, in soil is very limited. Uh, it's maximum in wetland soil is about three to four months but that actually helps retard growth of the plant in the future for the next few years of treatment. Ideally, what you do is you, since this has been mowing or been chewed on for the last few years, that helps me a lot because what you're really applying the material is almost all fresh growth. That really means you get in a high 80 percentile kill the first year. The second season uh, will get rid of a good chunk to up to you know eight to 10 percent. And that third season is generally any kind of um, stragglers or plants that, that aren't, aren't taken up by the Phragmites. I use a, a totally amphibious piece of equipment called a Marshmaster. It has a, a less than one pound per square inch uh, footprint on the wetland, so it's very the least impacting thing you can use. Uh, I, ideally, it goes out about one pint of active ingredient per acre. Um, can tell you anything else? It's it's been very effective. We've been doing this quite right, 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 since 2003 uh, in the Plum Bank and the uh, the uh, U.S. Federal uh, Reserve up there, uh, also for the towns of you know Salisbury and towns adjacent to the Merrimack River, uh, with a lot of success. They have us come up and do something every year for at least about a week to two weeks, and we've been chipping away at that since uh, since 03. Then we have questions about the product or methodologies. I do. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm curious what the impact will be to the native species. Does it just destroy the Phragmites and non-native species? Well, it'll affect any plant. So the targeting of the plant is it's, it's applied with a, not a boom sprayer. So it's not a random just uh, painting the world type effect. There's a gentleman actually that holds a, 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 a say for better lack of a term, a spray gun and applies it directly to the plant. Um, we're very careful about drift. There's an additive or an adjunct that's a drift inhibitor. So you don't want it drifting onto other plants uh, because primarily it'll, it'll kill living plants. Um, animals or, or you know, any crustaceans, anything in the sea, it doesn't have that particular enzyme in it. So there's no reaction, just plants have a reaction. So we're very particular about where it goes. When we've done this work in the refuge uh, after two seasons, the native plants take over quite readily once we've finished there and it's been cleaned out. It's actually quite remarkable what's been done up there. If you get a chance to go visit the refuge, um, ask them where they've been doing the Phragmites control. And they'll show you, we can show you like, I don't know, it's like 3,000 acres. We've been reduced down to about five acres of Phragmites over the last 10 years. So it's, and what's taken their place are the natural grasses, the bulrushes. Uh, if you can get the salt marsh water back just back into that wetland, you'll get the patents and the alternate floors coming back. Those are the low grasses that should be there. Um, salt marshes in general are probably New England's most, uh, actually the East Coast's most, most valuable resource. Most of the nutrients that exchange in our oceans that feed the fish, that feed our food chains start in the wetlands. And if you're familiar with that, the, the breakdown of those nutrients happen in wetlands that, that send those nutrients out to the oceans to feed the diatoms and the small phytoplanktons they're again fed, feeding the, the entire food chain up to whales. So the more wetlands you have, the more functional wetlands you have, the more opportunity for our oceans to be healthier. And we're down to less than something like 10% of wetlands that we you know, that we once had on the East Coast. And um, generally, if you have an opportunity to save some of them, it's, it's a good thing if you can. And Phragmites is such a, it's a non-native, very aggressive plant. Its tenacity is shown, you've been mowing it for years. It just kind of makes it angry when you mow it. 
Uh, it prunes it, it loves it. It, can, it can't be killed by mowing or burning, which were methods they've tried for years. Uh, I know the history of fragmented control in Connecticut has been since the early 60s. Um, and I've you know, been, been kind of following that for the last 39 years. Uh, so I've got a lot of experience of, of doing this specifically. Thank you. Yep. Question. Any other questions? Um, Go ahead, David. Don, when, when do you think you would like to start doing this work? So we, we're going to be mowing the Phragmites at the end of this month. Um, and so Kurt had expressed that right after we mow it would be ideal um, um, would be ideal to, to spray the Phragmites. Which... Well, well, no, I'm sorry, that's incorrect. You don't want anything mowed oh. before we spray. If you mow it, if you cut that plant down, the ability for the plant to absorb the herbicide is removed. You can't absorb herbicide. Oh, I thought you, I thought you told me you needed to it, mow it. Oh. When it's what I'm saying, it's been mowed so many times over the many years oh. Oh. that all that dead rack and material that's there. When I go into a place that has has been growing for 50 to 80 to 100 years, you have year after year after year growth and die off and growth and die off. So when I'm applying the herbicide, I am, it's the preferred method to apply herbicide to a growing, actively growing plant because the plant has to do something called translocation. That's the ability of the plant to take up that herbicide. It blocks that enzyme. The plant no longer can, can make that enzyme that makes amino acids. So the plant can't make any more food. If you cut that plant, my introduction of the herbicide is over. I can't do anything. That, that'll be next year if it gets cut. Um, you can apply the herbicide up to the senesce or the, the, the dying off of the plant, which in, where you are is probably by mid-October, end of October. So my window with this particular herbicide is basically when the plant gets to about a height of five feet through the growing season. I mean, you, if we can't get it, you know, if you're to do something this year, you can mow it as usual if you want to, but I can't herbicide it if it's mowed because there's no way for the action to happen to the plant. Okay. And, and the other question I had is, I mean, you're up in Ipswich and Great Bay. I'm assuming you're working with Audubon up there. I have done work with Audubon. We've done pepperweed control with Audubon. We've done Phragmites control with Audubon. I work with Peter Fippen with the um, uh, Merrimack Valley Planning Commission. We work directly with the refuge um, directly. Uh, in 03, we started working with them. Uh, everything on the Plum Bank and Newburyport and New, uh, Newberry. Um, Genius. It's been five, six towns we do right now. I'm, I'll be heading back up to um, Salisbury September 14th, the week of September 14th through that week. And I think part of the plan was swing by here. It's about, it's under six acres of actual treatment area here. It would take me about two tanks of my material, about 170 gallons of material out of the back of that machine. And I think the, the economy of scale, rather than having me drive back from Connecticut back to Revere is like on your way down, stop in and do something if we could, if it, if it could be worked out. Um, I wanna make sure there was a, there were some questions that I had. You have a WPA form one. Are you familiar with that form? I am, yeah. What was the it's question? The, it's the determination of applicability. Um, it actually is something that should be in like during this meeting, it should have been something for you to look at and DEP to look at. Yeah, we'll talk, we'll, what, we'll, what we'll do is we'll talk about that in the morning, me and you, so you can get it in. And in the meantime, we can uh, probably get this work started. Um, but I'd like to check with Audubon and make sure they vetted the product because, I mean, it sounds good. I mean, science sounds so, um, sound, but um, yeah, a, I do a, have a, some a, concerns about it. Yeah, a Mazapir is the active ingredient. You always want to refer to the product is a Mazapir. I did bring a label with me, but it's uh, A M E S. Let me get my. I'm a great speller here. It is. Its true name is. If you want to write this down, it's I S O P R O P Y L A M I N E Salt S A L T of a Mazapir. I M A Z A. P Y R. That's that's what you want to call it, and it's trade name like like Kleenex of tissue or a tissue paper. This particular one has, has an aquatic um, an aquatic ability. You can use it in aquatic situations. That's why Polaris AC Complete is the one. Um, I've had a lot of different Amazapirs I've used over the years. This is my favorite. It's 
the most effective. Um, it's very targeted for the treatment for the plants. You don't just space spray it and let it go over the place. Okay. Um, and I've had a lot of success with using that, that product specifically for Phragmites because of its deep, deep root mass. Kurt, do you have a, a, a cut sheet of this a product that you can email me and I'll forward it to Nick? And he can uh, send it yeah, to me. You, you, you can MSDS, uh, you know, it's actually the name of the, the manufacturer is New Farm, N U F A R M. Their website will let you see every MSDS and the actual safety sheet and also the, the ingredient sheet along with the label. Everybody always wants to see the label. Um, I can get, get you that too. That's fairly easy. Or at least a link to the to the people who make it, where you can look at their website. Okay. And all all labels are federally le regulated, so they can't they can't play around with like yeah. you know things that aren't tested out. For and instance, we do have products that are for aquatic use. The amount of testing they have to pass uh, to be an aquatically labeled product is is incredible. It's different than a terrestrial label product uh, because it's it can make it into water course. It's it's very specifically um, where does it go when it hits the water. For instance, when, when this product hits the water, if there's sediment in the water, it binds with sediment and falls to the bottom of, of whatever water body it is and it breaks down very quickly in water. So it can't just, it doesn't linger or, or stand itself in the water. The only action it has is in soil and the soil action in wetlands is anywhere from you know five to seven months. If it's terrestrial, it's seven to 13 months in soil. But then it's it's not able to be found in, or tested out in the soil. Okay. Any other commissioners have any questions? Uh, I, I don't. I know we this is basically just a discussion. But Kurt, we'll talk tomorrow about the the DOA, the Form One determination of applicability. Um, yeah. I think it's I think it's something that definitely needs to be done, and I don't think it's gonna evade any you know we're not doing any digging we're just spraying so right I, I well eventually it sounds, it sounds like your plan is to turn we turn that back and remove um the, the level of that soil so it's back to 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 what a, a salt marsh should be which is really yeah, good right. idea. Correct. Yeah. Um, but we need we need planning we need funding you know so it's probably not going to happen right away and i'm it's getting difficult to deal with that fragmity and i'm spending thirty thousand dollars a year for nothing um you know, there is in other areas too, but that area in particular um, just seems to be just so overgrown. Yeah. Well, even as a test spot for you, you, you would be pretty, uh, I think you'd be pretty pleased with what you get left with the results. Um, Phragmite, like any weed, uh, once it's controlled or, or removed, uh, I always ask people to have a little vigilance to the area that's treated because if you turn your back on it for 10 years or 15 years, it could very well come back. And I noticed adjacent to that property, uh, north to one A is a is the is a refuge, correct? It's the is it the Ram, Ramsey's refuge or what's the name of the refuge? Romney so, Marsh. Yes, Romney Marsh. Romney Marsh. Yeah, the Romney Marsh. Yeah. I think they I, I think there's some mowing of Phragmites there. You want to if you're adjacent to Phragmite fields when you remove the Phragmites that's in this area, the further out you can push removing the Phragmites, the better long term results you have. Now, seed stock in Phragmites isn't as viable as it used to be, but it's getting more viable because the monocultures of Phragmites make different versions of Phragmites, meaning that the seeds become one of the more important ways to let that plant propagate. Root systems are, are its main way, sending out uh, to runners and roots like strawberry plants. The plant works very, very aggressively by, uh, by sending out roots and runners. So when you, you herbicide that for a couple of years, you uh, you have a really good good chance to keep that stuff down. Okay. All right, Kurt. Why don't we? Uh, so me and you will talk tomorrow. I know we tried to get a hold of me last week, but it just I was away. So, but let's yeah. talk tomorrow, and then I'll talk to Donnie in the meantime by email and all that stuff, and we'll um, hopefully we can get this approved, and Donnie can get what he's got to do on the city's end and get it taken care of. Very good. Thank you for your time tonight. All right, Chris. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Okay. Donnie, I'll talk to you soon. We'll uh, hopefully okay. get this all squared away soon for you. All right. Thank you, Nick. Right, so thank you. Thank, Have a good night. thank you. Thank you, members. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda was uh, the Point of Pine Jock Club. I'm not sure if Jay Bolton's on here. I don't think he is. Um, I'm going to talk to him in person. They're going to put a... If you remember last year, they asked to put some docks out on the... Um, 
on like the uh, in between the beach and the parking lot so they can repair them. Well, they want to do the same thing again this year, but only four, four of them at a time. They want to do four every year to be able to put them there and work on them as the, as the, through the winter. So he was going to try and come on tonight, but I'm going to have him put together an order of conditions um, or a determination of applicability if it's going to change anything. So he'll be on next month's agenda. That's all. I was going to have him come on tonight to talk, but he's down the cape. So other than that, we are done. I know there was a couple of communications that you guys might have seen from Hancock Associates for the 571 Revere Street. It's just their monitoring reports that they got to turn into us, but that is the old Cove site that we don't uh, we don't have any jurisdiction over anyways. They, actually, Jay Bolton is here. I'm sorry. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. Jay, are you there? Jay, you're, un you're muted. How about now? I can hear you now, sir. How are you? Good, guys. Sorry. Um, I'm down the Cape, so I was at a clam shack waiting for our takeout, so it came out. So I might have, <laughs> I may have lost you, Nick. So um, I, I did hang on, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys. Um, so basically what happened is, is, is last year we had a catastrophic nor'easter, as, as you guys know, and we – we needed to place a lot of our floats and docks in between the dune that the, um, the army Corps asked us to put in years and years ago, which we obliged and the dune grass and another dune that had formed on its own over the past years. Um, we did this in the fall when we took the, the floats out. And when we, when we pulled them out in the spring to, to put them back in our dockage system, there were no issues with the dune grass. And we have, plenty of pictures and things of this nature. We're constantly getting pressure from the neighbors to lower the height that we stack the floats. And the issue is, is our parking, not right now with COVID, but when COVID hopefully is over someday, when we have functions, it's very difficult for us to make room for enough cars when we have to stack the stacks lower, okay? So the neighbors have asked us time and time again, can we make the stacks lower? And we continually try to. Last year, because of the storm, it was, it was much easier because we needed to work on so many of the docks and the floats that we placed those docks and floats on dune grass that eventually grew back just as tall as it was the previous year. Um, there's that. There's also some docks that are still damaged, which we wish to lay across uh, to the right side of our building on our walkway to work on those in the fall. So there's basically two asks of the Yacht Club and uh, respectfully, we're asking permission to do these two particular things. And, and that's, that's what it is. And you know, I'm certainly here to answer any questions and provide any pictures as I may be able to. Okay. I think Jay, what we might need to do is the same like we did last year, do some sort of an order of conditions or a uh, determination of applicability. I actually think we did last year that it's not gonna, it's not going to destroy or harm anything, and it's uh, we're also helping the neighbors in, in one hand because we're giving them their view of the beach, and it's not so tall. So I think we can put something together as far as a determination of applicability, uh, to determine negative determination that's not going to harm anything. Um, and I think if we can have you guys put something together when we can vote on it at the October meeting, and I don't see a problem, but I don't know about my commissioners if they have any questions. Anybody have any questions for Jay? Out of the resident, do we have anybody from the resident side that that well, are contesting this or? Well, next, well, that's what we would have to do. Next month would be a, uh, a public hearing, so they would come to the hearing if there is a problem with it and give their you know, give their take on it then, whether they're for it or against it. Okay. And there's also and it's it's no secret. There's a little bit of a, a history down there with the neighborhood and the yacht club, and I, and I've gotten involved to try and mediate it and come up with a medium and this is part of the happy medium for the area at the yacht club so i think we'll have another site visit before next month's meeting and i'll have the neighbors there and tell them what they're going to do and and jay's more more than obliging to uh let them come on as well and figure it out and let's come up with a game plan and keep everybody happy yeah absolutely and you know All like, right. what you're trying to do the nick right was there was nick was there a question last year um a concern about um the vegetation coming back did it come back it did yeah jay, jay had mentioned that it came back Better than ever, you know, the, the dune grass and everything grew back, no problem. And the Phragmites? 
Uh, Jay, are you there? Can you hear us? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. All the vegetation that was there came back in full form. We didn't have any issues. Uh, the roads were gooses, any fragmites. We had, um, obviously, there's a lot of weeds in the area. Okay. We'd like to clean up some of that and try to get it more, um, more things that would actually hold the green grass uh, should some storms come about. So we're behind the neighborhood and we're getting a lot of people that are asking us, can we, can we do that again? And we just, we just want to make sure that we're doing it. Yeah, I think our best bet is to, we'll have a site visit, Jay, by the, by, by the end of this month and I'll put you on the agenda for October and let the neighbors know if they want to come in for it or against it, they can come and speak then. All right, sounds good, Nick. Thank you. All right, Jay. Thank you, Con Con. All right, talk to you later. All right, guys. All right, guys. Uh, yeah. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Are there any other questions? To adjourn. All right, motion to adjourn by Dave. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Heather. All right, good night, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night. I want to acknowledge that Ann Raponi was online with us listening. Yeah, Ann. I know she is there. Ann, we hope you're feeling well. You see. It seems like your mic is unmute. muted. You got to hit the unmute button, the little mic. I did. There I'm you go. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear yes. you now. Okay. Nice to hear I'm you. very glad to be back in the action again. All right. Nice. That's Thank awesome. Thank you for your concern. It's been a wonderful meeting, and I'm feeling a lot better. That's Thanks great. Thanks for that's acknowledging awesome. my presence. Absolutely. Well, your presence is felt, even though we're not in the same room, your presence is felt always. Thank you so much, and have a good <laughs> Good weekend. All right. Have a happy Stay later. Well. Stay uh, well. We'll Thank talk you. to everybody soon. Thank you, guys. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Ashley, we're all done.